Little Women, Chapter 12, Part 2. Miss Kate did know, did know several new games, and as the girls would not and the boys could not eat anymore, they all adjourned to the drawing room to play rigmarole. One person begins a story, any nonsense you like, and tells as long as he pleases, only taking care to stop short at some exciting point, when the next takes it up and does the same. It's very funny when well done. It makes a perfect jumble of tragical, comical stuff to laugh over. Please start it, Mr. Brook, said Kate with a commanding air, which surprised Meg, who treated the tutor with as much respect as any other gentleman. Lying on the grass at the feet of the two ladies, Mr. Brook obediently began the story, with the handsome brown eyes steadily fixed upon the sunshiny river. Once upon a time, a knight went out into the world to seek his fortune, for he had nothing but his sword and his shield. He traveled a long while, nearly eight and twenty years, and had a hard time of it, till he came to the palace of a good old king, who had offered a reward to anyone who could, would tame and train a fine but unbroken colt, of which he was very fond. The knight agreed to try, and got on slowly but surely, for the colt was a gallant fellow, and soon learned to love his new master, though he was freakish and wild. Every day, when he gave his lessons to this pet of the king's, the knight rode him through the city, and as he rode, he looked everywhere for a certain beautiful face, which he had seen many times in his dreams, but never found. One day, as he went prancing down a quiet street, he saw at the window of a ruinous castle the lovely face. He was delighted, and cried who lived in this old castle, and was told that several captive princesses were kept there by a spell, and spun all day to lay up money to buy their liberty. The knight wished intensely that he could free them, but he was poor, and could only go by each day, watching for the sweet face, and longing to see it out in the sunshine. At last he resolved to get into the castle and ask how he could help them. He went and knocked. The great door flew open, and he beheld a ravishingly lovely lady who exclaimed with a cry of rapture, At last, at last! continued Kate, who had read French novels and admired the style. "'Tis she!' cried Count Gustave, and fell at her feet in an ecstasy of joy. "'Oh, rise!' she said, extending a hand of marble fairness. "'Never! Till you tell me how I may rescue!' swore the knight, still kneeling. "'Alas, my cruel fate condemns me to remain here till my time is destroyed. Where is the villain? In the mob saloon. Go, brave heart, and save me from despair. I obey and return victorious or dead.' With these thrilling words, he rushed away, and flinging open the door of the mob salon, was about to enter when he received a stunning blow from the big Greek lexicon, which an old fellow in a black gown fired at him, said Ned. Instantly, sir, what's-his-name recovered himself, pitched the tyrant out of the window, and returned and turned to join the lady, victorious, but with a bump on his brow, found the door locked, tore up the curtains, made a rope ladder, got halfway down when the rattle broke, and he went head first into the moat, sixty feet below. Could swim like a duck, paddle around the castle till he came to a little door guarded by two stout fellows, knocked their heads together till they cracked like a couple of nuts. Then, by attracting the exertion of his prodigious strength, he smashed in the door one of a pair of stone steps covered with dust, a foot thick, toes as big as your fists, and spiders that would frighten you into hysterics, Miss March. At the top of these steps, he came plump into a sight that took his breath away and chilled his blood. A tall figure, all in white, with a veil over his face, and a lamp in its wasted hand, went on Meg. It beckons, gliding noiselessly before him down a corridor as dark and cold as any tomb. Shadowy effigies in armor stood on either side. A dead silence reigned. The la lamp burned blue, and the ghostly figure ever and anon turned its face toward him, showing the glitter of awful eyes through its white veil. They reached a curtain door, behind which sounded lovely music. He sprang forward to enter, but the specter plucked him back and waved threatening before him a snuff-box, said Joe, in a sepulchral tone, which convulsed the audience. Thank ye, said the knight politely, as he took a pinch and sneezed several, seven times so violently that his head fell off. Ha, ha, laughed the ghost, and having peeped through the keyhole at the princess's spinning away for dear life, the evil spirit picked up her victim and put him in a large tin box, where there were eleven other knights packed together without their heads like sardines, who all rose and began to dance like a hornpipe, cut in Fred, as Joe paused for breath. <clears throat> and as they danced, the rubbishy old castle turned to a man of war in full sail, up at the jib, reefed the tops and the halyards. Helm heartily and man the guns, roared the captain, as a Portuguese pirate hove in sight with the flag black as ink flying from her foremast. Go in and win, my hearties, says the captain, and a tremendous fight begun. Of course, the British beat. They always do. <coughs> no, they don't, cried Joe, aside. Having taken the private captain prisoner, sailed slap over the school schooner, whose decks were piled with dead, and Lee scuppers ran blood, for the order had been cutlasses and die hard. <coughs> <coughs> Bosun's mate, take a bite of the flying jib sheet, and threat this villain if you don't confess his sins double quick, said the British captain. The Portuguese held his tongue like a brick, and walked the plank, while the poly tars cheered like mad. 
but the sly dog dived, came up under the man of war, scuttled her, and down she went with all sail set to the bottom of the sea, 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 where, oh gracious, what shall I say? cried Sally, as Fred ended his rigmarole, in which he had jumbled together pell-mell nautical phrases and facts out of one of his favorite books. Well, they went to the bottom, and a nice mermaid welcomed them, but was much grieved on finding the box of headless knights, and kindly pickled them in brine, hoping to discover the mystery about them, for being a woman, she was curious. By and by, a diver came down, and the mermaid said, I'll give you this box of pearls if you can take it out, for she wanted to restore the old poor things to life, and couldn't raise the heavy load herself. So the diver hoisted it up, and was much disappointed on opening it to find no pearls. He left it in the great lonely field, where it was found by a little goose girl, who kept a hundred... Fat geese, <clears throat> pretty fat geese in the field," said Amy when Sally's invention gave up. The little girl was sorry for them and asked an old woman what she should do to help them. "Your geese will tell you they know everything," said the old woman. So she asked what she should use for new heads, since the old ones were lost and all the geese opened their hundred mouths and screamed, "Cabbages!" Continued Laurie promptly. "Just the thing," said the girl and ran to get twelve fine ones from her garden. She put them on. The knights revived at once, thanked her, and went on their way to rejoicing never knowing the difference, for there were so many other heads like them in the world that no one thought anything of it. The knight in whom I'm interested went back to find the pretty face and learned that the princesses had spun themselves free and all gone to be married but one. He was in a great state of mind at that, and mounting the colt, who stood by him through thick and thin, rushed to the castle to see which was left. Peeping over the head, she saw the queen of his affections picking flowers in her garden. Will you give me a rose? said he. You must come and get it. I can't come to you. It isn't proper, said she, as sweet as honey. He tried to climb over the hedge, but it seemed to go higher and higher. Then he tried to push through, but it grew thicker and thicker, and he was in despair. So he patiently broke twig after twig, till he had made a little hole through which he peeped, saying, imploringly, Let me in! Let me in! But the pretty princess did not seem to understand, for she picked a rose quietly and left him to find his way in. Whether he did or not, Frank will tell you. I can't. I'm not playing. I never do, said Frank, dismayed at the sentimental predicament out of which he was to rescue the absurd couple. Beth had disappeared behind Joe, and Grace was asleep. So the poor knight is to be left sticking in the hedge, is he? asked Mr. Brook, still watching the river and playing with the wild rose in his buttonhole. I guess the princess gave him a posy and opened the gate after a while, said Laurie, smiling to himself as he threw acorns at his tutor. What a pizza of nonsense we have made. With practice, we might do something quite clever. Do you know truth? asked Sally, after they had laughed over their story. I hope so, said Meg soberly. The game, I mean. What is it? said Fred. While you pile up your hands, choose a number and draw and turn, and the person who draws at the number has to answer truly any questions put by the rest. It's great fun. Let's try it, asked Joe, who liked new experiments. Miss Kate and Mr. Brooke, Meg and Ned declined, but Fred, Sally, Joe, and Laurie piled and drew, and the lot fell to Laurie. Who are heroes? asked Joe. Grandfather and Napoleon. Which lady here do you think prettiest? said Sally. Margaret. Which do you like best? from Fred. Joe. Oh, sorry. Which do you like best? from Fred. Joe, of course. What silly questions you asked? And Joe gave a disdainful shrug as the rest laughed at Laurie's matter-of-fact tone. Try again. Truth isn't a bad game, said Fred. It's a very good one for you, retorted Joe in a low voice. Her turn came next. What is your greatest fault? asked Fred, by way of testing in her the virtue he lacked himself. A quick temper. What do you wish for? said Laurie. A pair of boot lacings, returned Joe, guessing and defeating his purpose. Not a true answer. You must say what you really do want most. Genius, don't you wish you could give it to me, Laurie? And she slyly smiled at his disappointed face. What virtues do you most admire in a man? asked Sally. Courage and honesty. Now my turn, said Fred, as his hand came last. Let's give it to him, whispered Laurie to Joe, who nodded and asked at once. Did you cheat at croquet? Well, yes, a little bit. Good. Did you take your story out of the sea line? said Laurie, rather. Don't you think the English nation per perfect in every respect? asked Sally. I should be ashamed of myself if I didn't. He's a true John Bull. Now, Miss Sally, you shall have a chance without waiting to draw. I'll harrow up your feelings first by asking if you don't think you are something of a flirt, said Laurie, as Joe nodded to Fred as a sign that peace was declared. You impertinent boy, of course I'm not, exclaimed Sally with an air that proved the contrary. What do you hate most? asked Fred. Spiders and rice pudding. What do you like best? asked Joe. Dancing in Fred's gloves. Well, I think truth is a very silly play. Let's have a sensible game of authors to refresh our minds, proposed Joe. Ned, Frank, and the little girls joined in this, and while it went on, the three elders sat apart talking. Miss Kate took out her sketch again, and Margaret watched her, while Mr. Brooke lay on the grass with a book, which she did not read. How beautifully you do it. I wish I could draw, said Meg, with mingled admiration and regret in her voice. 
Why don't you learn? I should think you had a taste and talent for it, replied Miss Kate graciously. I haven't time. Your mamma prefers other accomplishments, I fancy. So did mine, but I proved to her that I had talent by taking a few lessons privately, and then she was quite willing I could go on. Couldn't you do the same with your governess? I have none. Oh, I forgot. You young ladies in America go to school more than with us. Very fine schools they are, too, Papa says. You go to a private one, I suppose? I don't go at all. I am a governess myself. Hmm. I've been so afraid. Mr. Brooke looked up and said quickly, Young ladies in America love independence as much as their ancestors did, and are admired and respected for supporting themselves. Oh, yes, of course, it's very nice and proper in them to do so. We have many most respectable and worthy young women who do the same and are employed by the nobility, because being the daughters of gentlemen, they are both well-bred and accomplished, you know, said Miss Kate, in a patronizing tone, that hurt Meg's pride and made her work seem not only more distasteful, but disgrading. Did the German song suit, Miss March? inquired Mr. Brooke, breaking an awkward pause. Oh, yes, it was very sweet, and I'm much obliged to whoever translated it for me. And Meg's downcast face brightened as she spoke. Don't you be German? asked Miss Kate, with a look of surprise. Not very well. My father, who taught me, is away, and I don't get on very fast alone, for I've no one to correct my pronunciation. Try a little now. Here is Schiller's Mary Stuart, and a tutor who loves to teach. And Mr. Brooke laid his book on her lap with an inviting bow. It's so hard, I'm afraid to try, said Meg, grateful, but bashful in the presence of the accomplished young lady beside her. I read a bit to encourage you, said Miss, and Miss Kate read one of the most beautiful passages in a perfectly correct but perfectly expressionless manner. Mr. Brooke made no comment as she returned the book to Meg, who said innocently, innocently I-, I thought it was poetry. Some of it is. Try this passage. There was a queer smile about Mr. Brooke's mouth as he opened at poor Mary's lament. Meg, obediently following the long grass blade which her new tutor used to point with, read slowly and timidly, unconsciously making poetry the hard words by the soft intention of her musical voice. Down the page with a green guide, and presently forgetting her listener in the beauty of the sad scene, Meg read as if alone, giving a little touch of tragedy to the words of the unhappy queen. If she had seen the brown eyes, then she would have stopped short, but she never looked up, and the lesson was not spoiled for her. Very well indeed, said Mr. Brooke as she paused, quite ignoring her many mistakes, and looking as if he did, indeed, love to teach. Miss Kate put up her glass, and having taken a survey of the little tableau before her, <clears throat> shut her sketchbook, saying with condescension, You've a nice accent, and in time will be a clever reader. I advise you to learn, for German is a valuable accomplishment to teachers. I must look after Grace. She is romping. And Miss Kate strolled away, adding to herself with a shrug. <laughs> I didn't come to chaperone a governess, though she is young and pretty. What odd people these Yankees are. I'm afraid Laurie will be quite spoilt among them. I forgot that English people rather turn up their noses at governesses and don't treat them as we do, said Meg, looking after the retreating figure, figure with an annoyed expression. Tutors also have a rather hard time of it there, as I know to myself. There's no place like America for us workers, Miss Margaret, said Mr. Brooke, looking so contented and cheerful that Meg was ashamed to lament her hard lot. I'm glad that I live in it then. I don't like my work, but I get a good deal of satisfaction out of it after all, so I won't complain. I only wish I liked teaching as you do. I think you would if you had Laura for a pupil. I should be sorry to lose him next year, said Mr. Brooke, busily pump- punching holes in the turf. Going to college, I suppose? Meg's lips asked that question, but her eyes added, and what becomes of you? Yes, it's high time he went, for he is ready, and as soon as he is off, I shall turn soldier. I am needed. I'm glad of that, exclaimed Meg. I should think every young man who would want to go, though it is hard for the mothers and sisters who stay at home, she added sorrowfully. I have neither, or had very few friends, to care whether I live or die, said Mr. Brooke rather bitterly, as he absently put the dead rose in the hole he had made and covered it up like a little grave. Laurie and his grandfather would care a great deal, and we should all be very sorry to have any harm happen to you, said Meg heartily. Thank you. That sounds pleasant, began Mr. Brooke, looking cheerful again. But before he could finish his speech, Ned, mounted on the old horse, came lumbering up to display his equestrian skill before the young ladies, and there was no more quiet that day. Don't you love to ride? asked Grace of Amy as they stood resting after a race round the field with the others led by Ned. I doubt upon it. My sister Mag used to ride when Papa was rich, but we don't keep any horses now except Ellen Tree, added Amy laughing. Tell me about Ellen Tree. Is it a donkey? asked Grace curiously. Why, you see, Joe is crazy about horses, and so am I, but we've only got an old side saddle and no horse. Out in our garden is an apple tree that has a nice low branch, so Joe put the saddle on it, fixed some reins on the part that turns up, and we bounce away on Ellen Tree whenever we like. How funny, laughed Grace. 
I have a pony at home and ride nearly every day in the park with Fred and Kate. It's very nice, for my friends go too, and the row is full of ladies and gentlemen. My dear, how charming! I hope I shall go abroad some day, but I'd rather go to Rome than the row, said Amy, who had not the remotest idea what the row was and wouldn't have asked for the world. Frank, sitting just behind the little girls, heard what they were saying, and pushed his crutch away from him with an impatient gesture as he watched the active lads going through all sorts of comical gymnastics. Beth, who was collecting the scattered author cards, looked up and said in her shy yet friendly way, I'm afraid you're tired. Can, can I do anything for you? Talk to me, please. It's dull sitting by myself, answered Frank, who had evidently been used to being made much of at home. If he had asked her to deliver a Latin oration, it would not have seemed a more impossible task than to bashful Beth. But there was no place to run to, no Joe to hide behind now, and the poor boy looked so wistfully at her that she bravely resolved to try. What do you like to talk about? she asked, fumbling over the cards and dropping half as she tried to tie them up. Well, I like to hear about cricket and boating and hunting, said Frank, who had not yet learned to suit his amusements to a straight. My heart, what shall I do? I don't know anything about them, thought Beth. And forgetting the boy's misfortune in her flurry, she said, hoping to make him talk, I never saw any hunting. "'But I suppose you know all about it.' "'I did once, but I can never hunt again, "'for I got hurt leaping a confounded five-barred gate, "'so there are no more horses and hounds for me,' "'said Frank, with a sigh that made Beth hate herself "'for her innocent blunder. "'You are dear and much prettier than our ugly buffaloes,' "'she said, turning to the prairies for help, "'and feeling glad that she had run, read one of the boys' books "'in which Joe delighted. "'Buffaloes proved soothing and satisfactory, "'and in her eagerness to amuse another, "'Beth forgot herself and was quite unconscious "'of her sister's surprise and delight, at the unusual spectacle of Beth talking away to one of the dreadful boys against whom she had beg protection. Bless her heart, she pities him, so she is good to him, said Joe, beaming at her from the croquet ground. I always said she was a little saint, added Meg, as if there could be no further doubt of it. I haven't heard Frank laugh so much for ever so long, said Grace to Amy as they sat discussing dolls and making tea sets out of the acorn cups. My sister Beth is a very fastidious girl when she likes to be said Amy, well pleased at Beth's success. She meant fascinating, but as Grace didn't know the exact meaning of either word, fastidious sounded well and made a good impression. An impromptu circus, fox and geese, and, and an amicable, amicable game of croquet finished the afternoon. At sunset, the tent was struck, campers packed, wickets pulled up, boats loaded, and the whole party floated down the river, singing at the tops of their voice. Ned, getting sentimental, warbled a serenade with a pensive refrain, Alone, alone, ah, woe, alone. And at the lines, we are each young, we each have a heart. Oh, why should we stand thus coldly apart? He looked at Meg with such a lackadaisical expression that she laughed outright and spoiled his song. How can you be so cruel to me? He whispered under cover of a lively chorus. You've kept close to that starched up English woman all day, and now you snub me. I didn't mean to. But you look so funny, I really couldn't help it, replied Meg, passing over the first part of his approach, for it was quite true that she had shunned him, remembering the Moffat party and the talk after it. Ned was offended and turned to Sally for consolation, saying to her rather pettishly, There isn't a bit of a flirt in that girl, is there? <laughs> Not a particle, but she's a dear, returned Sally, defending her friend even while confessing her shortcomings. She's on a stricken dear, anyway said Ned, trying to be witty, and succeeding as well as every young gen as very young gentlemen usually do. On the lawn where it had gathered, the little party separated with cordial good nights and goodbyes, for the Vaughns were going to Canada. As the four sisters went home through the garden, Miss Kate looked after them, saying without the patronizing tone in her voice, In spite of the demonstrative manners, American girls are very nice when one knows them. I quite agree with you, said Mr. Brooke.